Hello world, it's Austin. Let's talk about being transgender and Christian. I have a huge treat for you today. Uh, I got to interview Allison Dillon Robinson while we were both at the Gay Christian Network conference uh, two weekends ago, and it was amazing, and I'm so glad I got to talk to her, but instead of talking about how awesome she is, let's just cut to the video of me fangirling over her answers to my questions. So I hope you enjoy this video, and uh, if you have any questions about anything that either Allison or I says, make sure you put it down in comments below, and we'll see you next week. Hey everybody, how's it going? It's Austin. Uh, this is my wonderful friend Allison Dillon Robinson. She's amazing. Uh, she agreed to come on and answer some questions that I have and I thought it might be helpful for you guys as well. So, uh, how are you doing, Allison? I'm doing well. I agreed to come on. I'm like thrilled to be on. So, <laughs> thank you so much for asking me. Can you tell us a little bit about you and about uh, your pronouns and anything you'd like them to know? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. um, so, my full name is Allison Dylan Robinson, and I kind of like to use the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's all very special to me. Not very many people get the chance to like pick their name, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, I use uh, she, her, hers mm -hmm. as my pronouns, and uh, I feel very comfortable with that. Is there, is there a time that you can think of, like looking back in your experience of coming out as trans and, um, and trying to uh, figure out how that interwove in with your faith identity? Is there a time that you can remember where it was really difficult to get those things to go together? Yeah, I, I mean, this, is, this describes most of my life, mm -hmm. right, until I was in my early 30s when uh, um, when when sort of things finally broke through, and I and I ended up starting my transition, uh, I I just genuinely, sincerely believed that uh, that this uh, that this person in me that I knew that I was uh, was was somehow disgusting to God, um, and that uh, the only way for me to be uh, to be worthy of of all that God had done for me. Was, was to shed that, um, and so I, I sought to do that in every way that I could for, uh, you know, for decades of my life. I, I prayed, I memorized like whole chapters of scripture. I, uh, I, I, I sought prayer of others and these sort of, you know, um, like promise keeper groups. Mm -hmm. I'm, so I'm sort of dating myself into the 90s <laughs> there, right? But uh, uh, from, from men, uh, and I, uh, I even, I even asked for uh, an exorcism. Mm -hmm. uh, and people, you know, pray over me and anoint me and, and exorcise the demon of, of, of femininity from me. Mm -hmm. um, I see how well that turned out. Right, but, clearly worked. <laughs> yeah, right. Obviously, good job, guys. Um, you might want to go back to school. Or something. Uh, so yeah, it, this was, this is sort of just a, a, a decades-long struggle that kind of ended with me. Uh, on the edge of suicide uh, because because I couldn't figure out how these two things could possibly resolve. Uh, and so the cartoon version is me looking at my watch and looking up at heaven and being like, look, God, it's been 30 years, right? I've been praying for you to fix this thing for 30 years and not only have you not fixed it, but it's gotten worse. Um, and now I just don't know how to live with it. Um, and uh, I, I'm just, I'm just so grateful that uh, that, that, that by grace, I was helped to see that that was not the that, that was not the way. Yeah, I didn't know what the way was, but but I just I, I just knew uh, I just knew that that was that it was not that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a common experience for a lot of the people that I have talked to that are trans. Where they, um, I mean, most of the people that I talk to are like in their mid-twenties or like between like 20 and 30 or so and so they've had less time to sort of internalize those messages but like I don't know I don't know if maybe even time matters at that point like if you're internalizing that it's just toxic. <laughs> well and, and Austin I'm, I'm sure I can imagine your experience is similar I didn't need the church to tell me those things right, right. I had already internalized so much shame yep. just from like the world yeah uh, from my kindergarten classmates right um, from TV, uh, right. that uh, what the church really did, that church, what that church really did was just gave me a theological framework um, mm -hmm. for what the world had already told me about myself, that, that right. I was shameful and that there was no place for me. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's, it's when you get to the point where you are, like you're already getting all these messages from the outside world, when you're in a faith community and they're like, 
saying negative things is one thing, and that's very hard, difficult to deal with. But even just silence on the issue yes. is like almost equally as bad. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> because you assume that they are agreeing with what you're seeing right. in the rest of the world. Right. It yeah. affirms the broader social norm. I think yep. that's true. That's yep. a good point. Yeah. Um, so you know, on a happier note, is there ever a time when your faith or identity and your gender identity where they kind of came together and you went, yes, this is all right, like this is good? Or, or, do you have an experience like that? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, there are, are, are two two things that come to mind for me. Just kind of picking up where I left off, I, uh, you know, I started therapy started studying and reading uh, and, uh, and and up to the up to that point in my head there had only been a few options you know as someone who's a Baptist who uh, you know from a tradition that takes that takes text very seriously um, I I needed to deal with the texts yeah. uh, in order to uh, to work my way through this so uh, up to that point it had seemed as though there was only a couple of options right one was rationally that maybe the reason God had not answered my prayers is that there was no God, mm-hmm. uh, that that uh, that I was just part of some grand religious delusion, right? Yeah. Um, but but that didn't that didn't harmonize with my experience of the world. I had experienced God in the world, yes, um, and I knew that I knew that couldn't be. Um, uh, another option was that that there was God, but the God was not who I had been led to believe God was, right? Maybe God was not compassionate in the way that I thought. Um, maybe even God was taking some pleasure in, in my suffering, right? Uh, and I had to sort of weigh that out as a rational option uh, and then decided that if that's really who God was, that I would not worship that God. Uh, I, I, if, if I had the freedom to choose, that I would not choose to worship a God uh, that was glorified or or felt or received glory in my pain and in my suffering. Um, the, the, the third option that kind of was immediately available to me, right, was that that uh, that there was a God and that God was compassionate and loving and all those things, but but that God had done this to me for a purpose, mm-hmm. right? Um, I really had to wrestle with that one because there's the whole, you know, Paul's thorn in the flesh right, and right. all of those things. Um, in fact, I took a whole like seminary course just to be able to kind of dive into those. Of course, my professors didn't do this, but sure. that was like, my primary purpose <laughs> for, for taking a third Greek course. Um, what I realized through my study and prayer was that um, was that if, if God had done these things to me um, to, to, to cause some change in me or to correct me for something, that God had never told me what that was. Yeah. Right? Uh, and, and as a parent, I will confess to have occasionally... Uh, you know, brought suffering into my children's lives in order to teach them things. But when I do that, I always, I tell them, here's what I expect you to learn from this. Yes. Because I don't want that suffering to go on any longer than it absolutely mm-hmm. has to for them to learn what they need to learn. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to the best of my knowledge, I had never seen anything like that from God telling me, here's why, I, here's what I'm trying to correct in you or here's what I'm trying to teach you. Yeah. So for the longest time, I was kind of stuck with those until I realized there was another option, mm-hmm. right? reason uh, the reason God had not fixed me is because I wasn't broken um, right? <laughs> and that I was in fact free uh, to what's Isaiah's words right seek peace and pursue it mm-hmm. and not just through uh, the, 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 the scriptural and traditional means that I had pursued up to that point but through medicine and psychology mm-hmm. and, and community mm-hmm. right uh, that, that those things were things of God as much as the text and as much as the tradition yeah was that realization that finally brought together the world of my faith and the world of my of my deepest self mm-hmm. and allowed the two to actually coexist with one another rather than having that big old collision where only one of them survives. Mm-hmm. That's so great. That's yeah. I ugh, I have so many things I want to say, but that's so great. <laughs> well, the other, I, I mentioned, I said there were two, and, and briefly the other is mm-hmm. just that. Uh, is when my church in Washington, D.C. last year, Calvary Baptist Church, uh, when they asked me to be uh, to be their, their transitional pastor, uh, one of our senior pastor, Reverend Dr. Amy Butler, uh, departed for the Riverside Church. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I told them that I would love to do that, uh, that I had a concern because my ordination uh, had come to me 15 or 20 years mm-hmm. before from from a church that no longer was willing to to sure. hold my ordination, and so I asked them if they would 
if they would take my ordination and hold it. Uh, and so we held a, we held a, a ceremony during a worship service on Sunday, uh, and, and, and my church uh, affirmed my calling and affirmed my ordination as me, uh, as as the woman of God and the daughter of God that I am. And I don't think I ever felt as as integrated right, as I did as I did in that moment and as I have since then. Yeah, I've talked to um, I've talked to Adam who also have a video in on this channel and uh, he had said the same thing that that moment that he felt totally affirmed was the moment when his church community members came around him and said we are now going to remember your baptism as you yes. like, as yourself to reaffirm this and it's yeah it's amazing what community affirmation of your identity can do it is you know? it is you know we, we talk about our our, our 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 driving goal and our desire being health and wholeness mm -hmm. And, and spiritual community plays such a powerful role in both of those. Yes, absolutely. Um, what would you, like, if you were going to talk to um, the rest of the LGBT community, uh, which is a very large community, some of whom don't know a whole lot about trans issues, uh, maybe don't know a whole lot about, like, trans women specifically, or uh, if you were talking to LGBT folks, what would you wish that they knew about what it's like to be a trans woman? Yeah, that's a great question. What I think I want to talk about is I think I would want to I think I want them to I think I want to help them recognize um, that in many ways you know if I can sort of uh, draw the threads apart a little bit for a moment uh, that there's tremendous intersectionality between uh, transgender community and uh, community that gathers together around uh, a status a sexual minority status. Yes. Um, right. Uh, lesbian or gay or bisexual or, or pansexual or any number one of these identities. Mm -hmm. um, and, and by intersectionality here, I mean in the most basic way, right? Mm -hmm. Which is to say, I'm a bisexual woman. Right. Uh, and, and so, uh, bisexual issues are my issues. Mm -hmm. Issues of sexual orientation are my issues. Mm -hmm. Apart from the fact that I am a transgender woman. Right. Right. Uh, uh, helping, helping people to recognize the, the, the uh, the richness and the complexity of our identities, uh, I think is important. Yeah, I agree. There was, uh, I was talking to somebody earlier uh, who was talking about that whole sort of petition to like drop the cheat, drop the right, T yeah. in LGBT. Yeah. And talking about just how, uh, how silly that seems when you realize that so many trans people are mm -hmm. LG or B <laughs> or anything else, you know? Absolutely. Like, so you're... It's, it's not like it's a separate part of the community. It's all integrated into itself. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, last thing. Is there any sort of resource that you would love to point people to that you found to be really helpful uh, for you um, that you think would be helpful for other people? Yeah, definitely. Monica Roberts. Okay. Um, her, her blog's name is Transgrio, G-R-I-O-T. Uh, uh, Monica is a, uh, is a black trans transgender woman, uh, an elder in the movement. She's here in Houston, as a matter of oh, fact, okay. um, and has been, um, for, for so long, a, a powerful uh, voice for justice. Mm -hmm. And I'm really, really grateful for, for her presence uh, and the power of her advocacy in the community. Mm -hmm. You know, the other, the other resource that was so meaningful to me mm -hmm. in my own process, um, you know, as someone who, who, who came out, in, like I said, in my early 30s, mm -hmm. um, in the context of a 10-year marriage and four children, and who desperately wanted my own health and wholeness not to cost me those relationships. Yes. Uh, some of the very first places that uh, that I sought out were places uh, where there were other people who had those experiences. Uh, I found my way to, uh, uh, this is gonna really sound old school, but to an online bulletin board. Nice, I, I uh -huh. vaguely remember those. Yeah, yeah, there's this thing, right? <laughs> we call them forums today, yes, exactly. but essentially the same sort of thing, right? Yep. Uh, that's called um, My Husband Betty. Mm. The group of people uh, that were gathered there, uh, both you know trans women who were in my position and also partners of trans women mm. uh, who were there to support and encourage one another. Sure. Uh, that, that forum and, uh, and those people gave me hope, right? That, that I could, 
that I, I could actually do this. Yes. That was possible. Yes. So this is Helen Boyd's, uh, you know, it's all kind of built around Helen Boyd's books. My husband, Betty, and she's not the man I married. Okay. Uh, as a, a, Helen's a, a partner. I think I've um, seen those books. Before. Yeah. And, yeah. And she is fantastic. Um, and, but, but that whole community was really, really deeply meaningful to me. Yes. Uh, that was where I first met uh, Jenny Boylan. Mm, yes. You know, who, who started as a mentor and became a dear friend of mine. Um, somebody who I love dearly. Um, yeah, that was a space that for someone like me, as kind of a, a you know, an early 30s transitioner in the context of a marriage, um, meant so very much to me. I'm so grateful that those spaces existed. Wonderful. And there are probably spaces like that still now, most likely in the context of Facebook, I yeah, would guess. Yeah, right. Well, my husband Betty is still there. There you go. So, so look for it. Um, but they're also on Facebook as well. And Perfect. And have expanded in that sense. So, yeah. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much for thank being here for and for talking. Me. Finally. I know, I right? Say. It's been ages. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank uh, you for what you do. It's really, really important. Thanks. Thanks for watching, everybody. We will see you back here soon. Bye.